Welcome to Investor's Coffee Shop. We're your host, Brian Hart. Juanita Jaikaran. I have been working in the financial industry for over 17 years. I started in New York City and in 2010 expanded my business to Alexandria, Virginia. I have three years of experience in the financial industry. I have written articles that has been published on MarketWatch, Associate Press, Morningstar, and many more. Investor's Coffee Shop is for people who want to learn more about investing, make better decisions, create new streams and income. Each episode, we will discuss investing in real estate, stocks, bonds, art, antiques, wine, collectibles, and anything that may generate a profit. Join us at Investor's Coffee Shop. And we're back for second episode of Investor's Coffee Shop. Your host, Brian Hart. Juanita Jaikaran. We need to tell people who we are and why we're doing this. So about a year ago, we were discussing what it would be like to do a podcast to advertise not just our business, but who we are personally. Juanita works at my office at E1 Asset Management in New New Jersey, and I work in Washington, D.C. This second episode, we're going to talk about house flipping. Our first one, if you hadn't listened to it, please give it a listen. We are talking about first-time home flippers on the first episode. And today we have two special guests, Terry and Alex. And Terry and Alex, please tell us who you are. I'm Terry Palmer, a and Property Investments, LLC, originally from Washington, D.C., born and raised. And I'm Alex Mojilovich, also from a and Property Investments, LLC. Terry and I have been friends since fourth grade. How long have you guys been in business together? About eight years now. And what made you want to go in business together? Trust. That was it? Trust? Yes. And loyalty, I'm assuming? Yeah. I know he gets his job done, and he knows I get my job done. And that's the thing. And whatever comes in the market, we just have to flow with it. The A&T, they had flipped houses for about six years. Am I correct? Correct. And then after that, you guys went into buying land and building houses all the way up from ground to completion. Correct. Purchasing vacant, vacant lots and uh, building new construction. And when you were flipping homes, we want to know how well you guys did. How often did you actually make money? How often did you lose money? And how often did you just break even? What's the reality of flipping houses? The reality is it's very, uh, it's very risky. And to answer your question, we've lost a lot of money. We've made a little money. Things have been going better since we started doing new construction. I've always believed in you know your profit once you buy because that's why you're buying. And if you have any kind of organizational skills, which you should in any kind of business, that will answer all your questions. But then reality kicks in and markets change and things change for many people. So you just have to go with the flow. But I'm just a completer. And that's my, ma- my major focus. I'm more of the contractor slash investor. And Terry, my partner, is more of the investor. When you buy is really when you're making most of your profit. You need to buy right. The larger profit margin that you can see down the road upon completion of the project is really where you're going to make most of your profit. You know, you buy for X, you sell for Y, and the whole idea is... Hopefully there's not too many unforeseen costs. And a big thing for business, I think, is timing. So what resources are available for house flipping? Is it like Zillow? For your average person who's not a realtor, I use Zillow and Redfin the most. Uh, in the past, Zillow has not been a accurate. And I'm talking, you know, when we started off flipping, about eight years ago, a lot of the information you were getting on Zillow was inaccurate, so you needed other resources. MRIS is a good resource as well. And actually, when we started, I had a realtor that was a friend, and that would that allowed us to get the most accurate information from, from the system that realtors were using. And that's really your best your best resource. Like how does house flipping TV shows change the industry? So it really has made it look like it's easy. That's the main thing. And it's far, 
far from that. Also, I've noticed that they don't include a lot of the a lot of the pricing for the construction is not realistic, not accurate. Do you mean like before, like when they buy it, or during the whole process of them renovating? I find that the um, you know with the purchase pricing in those areas because everything's geographic regarding the pricing for the uh, for the properties that they're they're purchasing. I believe in those. I believe they're accurate. But I'm talking about the construction. The cost for the construction and doing the renovation is not realistic in a, in a lot of parts um, that you watch on TV. So um, I think that gets people thinking, oh, I can do that. That's easy. Everything and, I know is a lie. <laughs> yeah. All the TV shows is like such a lie. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually the contractor, so I deal with the lies. <laughs> just to give you like, let's say, an example we we'll just talk about one category, let's say masonry. You know, there's many categories in building. I've been doing this for 30 plus years, so I have a lot of resources. If you're coming in on the boat, as they say, good luck, because you are definitely going to, you're definitely going to, you know, most likely drown. It all looks good on paper, but, you know, it's reality. And I have these guys that have been working with me for a long time. So, for example, uh, let's say the mason says it's going to be 20000 and then at the end, oh, I, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this. And they only have all these upcharges. So let's say it's a $1,000 upcharge, which is, let's say, not much. And it's, re, you know, realistic. Well, you got 30 subs at 1000 30000 and you think your profit's thirty five. So you're working for them. So it's very, very tricky. And in flipping houses, if you've never done it before, uh, you might as well go down to the bare bone of the house that's the idea because then you've pretty much liquidated any other things that could happen, which we'll probably talk about later, in, like if there's a, a, a makeover house or a complete gut. What is the difference between the cosmetic flip and down to the studs? As you were discussing, bringing it down and building it back up, what is more profitable? I mean, which one as a first-time house flipper should they look for? Should they just do, hey, this only needs a splash of paint or this actually needs to be knocked down and rebuilt? Well, I mean, a, a lot of it has to do like, okay, I, th I believe in stories. So we, we, we did some houses in Petworth area off Georgia Avenue, Northwest DC. And I'm, we're actually born and raised in this area. So we kind of know the area to a point, but um, we would go in these houses with the intention of literally leaving the brick in the front, the back and the two sides, which are the neighbors, the brick and literally removing 100% of everything in the house as in staircases, the joist is going from left to right, which is, you know, going into the neighbor's house, into the wall, and the other neighbor's house into the other wall. And so, you, you know, you're kind of like literally removing everything. So there's not going to be as many hi hidden secrets, but that depends on the neighborhood. So most of the homes that we were doing, for example, in Petworth at the time, were those type of homes. Everybody was, comp it's called the complete gut. So you're starting literally from scratch, but you have to remove everything. But the problem is there's no, you know, you're working in a, such a small environment and there's no place to put stuff, the trash, permitting, and et cetera. But well, which one would you say is more profitable? Is it just the cosmetic or the teardown? On average, would you say, or is it we thought this was a cosmetic and it ended up being a teardown after we got inside the house? Well, to be blunt, I can't think. I have to know before I start. There's no thinking because then you're, then you already lost money. If you think you're going to go with a cosmetic and it has to be a complete rip out. I mean, you're, you're out of, you know, a lot of money, like fifty hundred thousand dollars because it's a totally different job. Say you like you go into like a house and you budget for it. I'm assuming you always end up spending more than you budget. Well, nowadays, especially this environment, just to change the story a little bit, we're building some houses and the, we're building the same house over and over again. And the lumber costs went for the exact same house within six weeks, $17,500 for the exact same order. It's like buying your same loaf of bread, but it went up that much. I mean, that's how you're supposed to handle that. So it went up 17,000 or that was the total cost? No, now. that's the, that's the total increase. So from 60,000 it went to 77,000. So, you know, you're already paying 60 because you know that's what the cost is, but it went up 17. So just to make the story sound a little bit better, well, the houses did go up too. 
So a house we thought was going to sell for, let's say, 400 really sold for 450 Well, we didn't make 50 We probably spent 30 We probably spent like 30000 So there was a little bit more of an increase. But again, the market is so up and down, you just don't know. You just, that's why I'm saying when you buy, that will answer your question if you're going to make. If you think you're going to make 15000 don't do it because you, you're probably going to make nothing. Well, then you got to pay taxes and everything else. So you're actually not making 15000 well, the 15000 is what you thought you are going to make. And then this guy wants 1000 for the masonry, and all these other people want something. Well, let me ask you this. When you're flipping a house, this is a big deal, at least I know in the D.C. area because I live there, permits. They can be delayed forever. That costs money because then you have holding costs and everything else that's involved. Can we explain to me how holding costs affect your business plus getting the permits? And are there times where you just have to do the job with or without the permits to get things moving? You got to start from the beginning and you're going to need capital, right, to purchase the property in the first place. You're going to need capital to do the construction and uh, or the renovation uh, in this case. So permitting, um, especially, unfortunately, with D.C. government, They've never been efficient for the most part regarding a lot of things. I hate to say it. You're going to have holding costs. So you have this, this capital that means that you're borrowing the money. And if you're borrowing the money, we'll say you're borrowing that money at 8 or 9%. If you are borrowing money from a hard money lender, which is what most flippers do when they start off flipping is to borrow money from a hard money lender. Hard money is exactly what it sounds like. It's hard to pay back (laughs) is what it is. It's at a higher rate. We're talking anywhere from 12% to 15% would be an average. Okay. Not your traditional bank loan. That's a whole, that's a whole nother thing. So when people hear three to 3.5, 3.5, now it's at 5.4, I think, as of today. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking twice as much as that to borrow. So when you're flipping, your chances are you're going to be using a certain amount of hard money. And so you're, you're holding, the longer you're holding on to that money, borrowing that money, the more it's costing you. So you can figure out the interest rate depending on how much you borrow at that point. Well, how long does the average flip take then? I mean, how long am I borrowing this money? How do I include that into the cost? You would probably be looking at six months just for the construction portion, right, Alex? And, um, and then after you include um, your, um, the time to get the permit and then to list the property at the tail end of the, the renovation... Um, a total of nine months. So nine to 10 months. So you should assume about a year. Yes, to be safe, I would say a year. Always go with the higher. In other words, if you tell yourself it's going to cost more and it costs you less, you make more, right? Yeah. So, well, that's what you should do. Tell yourself you're going to make less, but hopefully you'll make more. Don't tell yourself you're going to make more and then end up making less. So what people need to realize is 12%. Is probably the lower end of it, and it can go all the way up to 18%, depending on your credit worthiness and how often you've done this, or it can go even higher. And if it's going to take about a year, so let's just assume $100,000 increments, for every $100,000 you borrow, you're going to owe anywhere between twelve dollars to $18,000 just in interest. So you, before you even do the flip, you have to include that into the number, and that's a problem. Most people forget about that. Correct. You're going to minus that off your projected profit. Exactly. So has like any neighbors any caused any problems before when you're flipping a house? Sure. So I believe in always giving a story because it's the reality. So we're building a house in, like I said, for example, we'll go back to Petworth and the row homes. So there's like, you know, 20 houses in a row. Most DC properties, sorry to cut you off. Most DC properties are, are like that. There, there's very few that are, you know, that, that we've done or we've started with that were single family homes. Yeah. So like we did this one house for this in this Petworth area. And like I said, it's a row of homes. And 
to get to the point of the story is like we basically were almost done with the house. And so, you know, my gutter is going to go to the edge of my house and the downspout is going to go down. Well, the neighbor next to that and the neighbor next to that, so on and so forth, have the same situation, right? Well, so the neighbor complained that the water is going on his property. Well, where do you want your water to go? And where do you want the other person's water to go? So he actually called an inspector. And when the inspector came there, he told me the situation. I said, look, you know, it would be best if we go knock on the neighbor door. Don't tell me anything until you tell him and me at the same time. There's nothing to hide here. And then he basically told him, the inspector told the owner that, where's your water going? He didn't know what to say. So the inspector said, have a good day. And that was the end of that. This is all because of the next door neighbor caused all this. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what I believe uh, that situation Alex is talking about, that the adjoining roofs butt up to each other, to your property. So you're basically sharing the water, the water in, on these row homes. So you might have a brand new roof and done everything you can on your end, but you have a slope coming from the neighbors, which is impeding and causing issues on your property. And there's nothing you could do about that because, you know, you can't make them fix They're their adjoining. Roof. Yeah, yeah, they're adjoining. And uh, we had another situation that would be on uh, Fifth Street, on Fifth Street um, in Northwest with the uh, with the electrical pipe bust. And so in the day, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit better because I guess I'm yes. a contractor. So in the day, 100 years ago, they had something called a pipe bust. So think about we're in the Pepco area, electric service, you know, the poles, it, the power goes to one house. And from that one house, which let's say is your house, then it goes to house to the left, two houses. Then it goes to the houses to the right, two houses. So that one power source is going to all five houses. Yeah, no one understands that because that's how it was 100 years ago. There's only the ground. There's no other wire. Now there's two. So what are we doing? We're building a new house. So we can't use that power. So we have to, you know, so obviously. Wouldn't, wouldn't make the code. Right. We're not going to pass inspection. So that means we have to change the power. Okay, we already knew that. Well, the neighbor to the left, he's like, well, your pipe bus that's in your house is feeding my house. So we had to give him a whole new electric service. I'm talking just the service, not inside the house, so we could do our house. And that was like convincing of three months and, you know, trying to take him out to lunch and do whatever you can just so he would agree for me to give you free service. So in other words, it didn't cost him anything. Correct. But you still had to get the neighbor's permission even to do what you were doing. Well, yeah, and... You know, so when you have a neighbor that's not working with you, in this case, we had to actually, I, I, I told Alex because it was holding up our project and we were talking about holding cost uh, before, you know, it was holding us up to the point I said, just go ahead and pay for his electrical panel because we need to get into his house and upgrade the service in order to pass the electrical inspection so we could continue with our project. As soon as you have one department, you know, whether it's electrical, it's, it's plumbing, HVAC, and it's holding up, it's impeding the whole project because the next set of guys can't come in. Yeah, we have to stop completely. The job just had to go to stop. Right, and then we were talking about that holding cost, and that's a good example where it ended up costing, costing us a lot of money. So I just told Alex, let's just go ahead and offer to pay for his brand new electrical panel so we could uh, continue working in that situation. Let me just say one thing. So because of that problem, it probably cost us $50,000 because we lost time, three months waiting, had to pay for his service. Our permit was going to expire, right? You, they give you a year permit. You lost workers that are counting on you to yes. keep them employed. But the thing was, when we stopped working, we're not going there anymore, obviously. And we didn't know how long it's going to take. So we didn't want to invest, you know, three to four thousand dollars closing up the building that we just ripped out. So we got a, we got a fine for that. And then um, what happened was the permit people, they put you on the back burner unless you know somebody. And I hate to say it this way, but it's not what you know, it's who you know. Luckily, I know some people. 
So we were able to get out of it, but it took a little longer than we anticipated because it is what it is. No, we don't pay people under the table, but we do know that you have to know somebody in that in that clique. So he knows the other person in that clique. So you can we're not going to be on the bottom of the pile. And that's really what happens. So even once you get the permit, and depending what neighborhood you live in, it doesn't matter how long it takes, you have to deal with getting the permit. Then you have the neighbors who could delay the fact that the permit expires? No, no, no. They don't delay that the permit expires. They delay ours doing our job. So just to finish that part of the story, what happened was it's a year permit. That's how it always comes. And we literally had the year. It doesn't take longer than that, right? And then what we did was when we got stopped, you know, we stopped working because we couldn't work because they put a stop work. The permit was getting ready to expire, let's say December 31st. Well, my runner, the runner is a guy who gets the permits for me. He's like an expediter. And then he went to go get the permit on December 30th. And he got to the permit, and he got the permit because it, was, it wasn't expired, right? So he got the permit on December 30th for the next renewal for the next year, on December 30th at 4 p.m. Well, on December 31st at 9 a.m., they came and they stopped the job because the guy who was in that department didn't see that we got the permit because we haven't been there yet. It was 9 a.m. We got the permit at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and they put a stop job. And once we got the stop job, I think it was what? three to six months or something, we have to wait to start again. They don't answer the phone. They don't respond. They don't help. It's really scary. That was a little bit more than I was expecting, but... <laughs> it's definitely a mouthful, right? <laughs> that was, yeah, that was... So our... that made us almost go out of business. That one house for the electrical pipe bust, something that, you know, you would never expect. We lost probably 150000 and this is why people need to know this. It's not always what you see on TV and everything else. It's, this is the reality. It's things you can't control. You can't control your neighbors. You can't control how long it takes to get permits. You can't control what you find when you actually buy that house. When you buy a home, there are lots of people who try to flip homes themselves. Let's say you bought one of those homes and you're like, this is garbage. How often do you have to undo what the previous tenant in that house did to make it livable well there's i think there's two kinds of houses one's a complete gut which is to the studs or to the brick and the other one's called the lipstick makeover the lipstick makeover is basically just change the kitchens the bathroom sand the floor paint the walls leave all the electric leave all the plumbing leave all the hvac maybe put a new roof on you know paint the windows lipstick you know how your wife puts the lipstick on just cover everything Let's say somebody tried to put lipstick on. They decided to go with purple walls and red walls, things that aren't sellable. How often is it do you go in the house like, you know what? I see they tried to flip the kitchen and the bathroom. The bathroom's not done. They obviously ran out of money or the kitchen, no one's going to buy this kitchen. This is garbage. Why did they put these cabinets here? They should be over here. How often do you go in a house like, I don't know what that person was thinking, but they were absolutely wrong on this. My job is to research properties, and I take a look at a lot of, a lot of these properties. Most of our, our flips have been to the point where we need to do a, a full gut. But these lipstick properties that you're mentioning, it takes someone with a lot of experience like Alex to come in there and analyze everything and give you an accurate price on all the things that need to get done. And as you mentioned, Brian, you know, painting, painting the walls the wrong color and putting cabinets in the wrong location. People nowadays want the open floor plan, no matter what. As soon as you walk in the place, they want neutral colors. So it's on a case by case basis on how much money it's going to cost you. And it's really going to take somebody with experience to give you an accurate uh, accurate pricing. And, you know, luckily for me, me and Alex, with our working partnership, I don't expect too many unforeseen changes. Finding a good contractor that is not going to turn around, you know, get in there, give you one price, and then turn around and escalate the price as they start taking things apart is key. So a lot of people will spend too much money on the kitchen or they'll spend too much money on the shed or the landscaping. Where is the worst place when trying to flip a home you can put money in 
to make a profit. You can kind of flip that question around and say, this is where you need to put the money in. And it's, um, it's, uh, Alex, Alex will be able to answer and, and give some input on this, but you know, kitchens and bathrooms, you hear that a lot. And just as I previously mentioned, you know, an open floor plan. So perhaps taking, um, an interior wall down, stuff like that. Those are, uh, I think, uh, important points, but Alex can elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, I always go back to the beginning. You know, it's like when you buy, you have to know what you're doing. It's like a relationship. You're going into it or you're not. You got to know what the, you have to know what the deal is. You can't keep changing your mind as you're in it because that means you're going to keep losing and losing and losing. And so that's the big problem, I think, with a lot of people that want to do this business. They just have no idea. They think, oh, I'm going to make all this money. And this is going to be easy. I've been doing this for 30 years. And I, even today, I had to get rid of a guy I've known for 10 years and get another guy. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't deal with their problems to a point, of course. But I have to get my job done. Because then I'm going to keep losing money. Then I'll be out of business. So you, you have to really know what you're doing before you do it. So I would recommend if somebody really wants to do it, maybe maybe they should go work for somebody for a few months and you know, taste the medicine, if you know what I mean. There's things you shouldn't put a lot of money in, and there are things you should put a lot of money into when flipping homes, correct? Well, kitchens and baths, yeah, you put a lot more money in, I guess. So the main projects, is it always going to be kitchens and baths? Because why not take a ba- uh, basement and turn it into an apartment? Or why not add lots of flowers? Or I don't know, so I'm asking you, is it worth spending all that money on flowers in the front and backyard or driveway, have the driveway? Curb appeal is, is important. You know, that is in the eye of the beholder. So I, I really do go back to the, the points I made, the, uh, the kitchen and bathrooms and, and the layout. I think uh, opening the floor plan, I think those are going to be your three, your, your three top uh, choices. If you do have a basement, making it into, uh, for instance, an Airbnb. So you, if you have uh, a basement entrance, which you need to do by code. For example, uh, we're using uh, DC homes as an example. You can turn that into an Airbnb, but in order to do that, you will need to have a full bathroom. We'll say it just had a half bath previously. You need to convert that to a full bath. You also need a kitchen and perhaps their own washer and dryer. So the, um, the expense is a lot, but there's a lot of return potentially for that owner as well. And as the contractor, you have to make sure where you put their bedroom has to have a window and it can only be so many feet away from a circuit panel. And a lot of people don't know that. And they put the bedroom there and then they go for the final inspection and then they fail because the bedroom is right by the panel or in the same room. That's against code. And that's called an egress window. Yes. So when you're building like the kitchen and the bathroom, do you use like cheap materials or expensive materials? Hmm, I don't want to give all my secrets away now here, you know, but... Uh, you can fib a bit. Yeah, no, that's okay. So look, a cabinet is a cabinet, right? It's a piece of wood. Yeah. And my thing is, it's again, not what you know, it's who you know. So I have a lot of contacts and I know how to buy. So this is, this is you know, I've been doing this for, like I said, over 30 years, but I also had my own business prior to that when I was younger and so with it, just to guess, go to the kitchen is like, you can get a basic kitchen, but pay the granite guy the big money and give the real nice top. They won't even see the cabinet. And instead of spending $85 for a faucet, spend $300 for the big, huge faucet. And it's just going to pop because yeah. what, you know, you and my wife, we're going to go in there and look and she's gonna be like, wow, look at that. Wow. Look at that. It's called the wow factor. You know, that's all they want. And then, of course, uh, soft closing doors, if possible, and those kind of things. Because, I mean, that's just like now you have to have it or, you know, you can't even put it in your house anymore. What do you think about those pocket doors instead? Actually, you know, I, I kind of like pocket doors, especially in a, in a small home because, yeah. it, you know, it's space. So we actually do a lot of pocket doors. And that's the wow factor that we were talking about. Yes. People walk in and they see that. And so you do have to pick and choose where you're going to spend your money and how you're going to spend it and what your budget will allow. Do you think like the open door floor plan is going to stay? Because 
I've noticed before, if you like look through history with home designs, it obviously evolves. I feel like open floor plan in like 10, 20 years is not going to be the thing. Change with the times. Yeah. I don't know. I kind of agree with her because my house, I have a single family home in Alexandria, Virginia. It's not an open floor plan. I don't want people seeing my messy dishes. <laughs> and I prefer the walls covering up my nasty kitchen because I have two kids who make a mess every Hire week. a maid. <laughs> well, it he seems like everyone to. in D.C. does that. But, <laughs> but thinking of it, the open floor concept, I know that's a big thing when rebuilding homes or flipping homes and everything else. But is, is there a point where people realize, I just don't want my mess for everybody to see? Or is this really just the way people want? They want that big open field. Again, you go with the care. times. Yeah. Right now, I use repose gray in all my painting on the walls in the whole house for the last few years. I haven't changed the color. And people are like, wow. So there you go. If that has to change, it might be the light beige, which I used to do seven years ago. So you have to go with the flow. What about the theory that Steve Jobs has with Apple? People don't know what they want until you show them. So... What if you decided, you know what, I've done gray for the last four years. I know this works, but I think this is better. Maybe the open concept is not better. I think it's better. Have you ever tried that before of building a house? And has it paid off? Well, like, again, it's also depending on the house. You know, am I going to spend $10,000 to move a wall that's not going to make me 10000 Then no. It's all about the money. That's why you're doing the job. So you look at the job, it's going to cost you X, is to buy the property is going to cost you Y to fix, and the profit is, you know, Z. Well, that's your goal. And I hate to say it that way, but that's kind of what you're going for. You're not making the house for you. You're making it for the person who's going to be, you know, hopefully giving multiple offers, as they say so. But then you're doing what's in the neighborhood. You know, you look at all your competition, and you're going with the flow. Yeah, I think it's very risky to think, to, to go into a home and think, okay, I'm going to try this color out. I think it's very risky. you got to go with the times, as Alex says. You go in with the wrong color and say a potential owner walks in there and they're looking at the home and they're like, you know, I love the place, but the color's got to go. You can imagine the cost that you need to correct by repainting the home to get that seller to purchase. I don't have contractors. I don't even know how to find contractors. Um, would it, is it advisable to go the route of contractors or do what a lot of younger kids are doing? They're going to Google and YouTube and looking up this information. Good luck. The DIY stuff. The DIY stuff. She said it perfect. So <laughs> is that a profitable way of going about things or you need a contractor? Don't try to do it yourself if you don't know what you're doing. I mean, how do you go about this when you hear these things? Well, you can't be... A contractor if you're not because you don't even know what you're doing and a lot of people think oh i can do this so oh, i can do this again go back to what terry said hey you're borrowing money at 12 percent, and if you're the joe doing the job compared to 10 joes well it's going to take you 10 times longer and is that really cost effective so again you just have to have a game plan you know write out everything you're going to do like i have a, i'm still old school i got a three binder notebook Everyone gives me a joke about it, but at the same time, you can ask me any question on any house, and I can give you the exact answer at any moment. My accountant doesn't like me for it, but then he always asks me, he's like, so what's up with this? And I tell him right away, he's like, how do you know? Because I said I have it all, everything's law. With their, every receipt, every document goes into that folder. So if you don't really know what you're doing, you shouldn't really be doing the business. It's like any job. Before you even get the house, you have to have the money to get the house. And a lot of people go to their family or they'll go to a bank. I have a firm belief I don't do anything with my family. How do you guys feel about borrowing money from your parents? How do you get the money to do the house flip? When we started off, we started with a, um, a company that basically started teaching you how to house flip. One of the things that they talked about and encouraged was basically get the money any way you can. They you know, basically gave us the feeling, you know, it's probably okay to borrow the money from your parents. Ask relatives if they want to invest in real estate 
and invest in your business and you would then prov promise a certain percentage of interest on their money. My philosophy is you're probably going to get yourself into a bad family situation and create a bad family situation because you are projecting that you're going to make a profit, say, on your first flip or your second flip. And you're going to be able to pay, not only pay back the money that you owe, but pay, pay them extra money in interest. We'll say whatever, 7%, seven, 8%. Seven, the possibility of that happening is probably pretty slim. Like Alex said, you need to know what you're doing and have, uh, have experience and looking at doing it yourself, YouTube videos and, and uh, watching the TV shows is not advisable. Go get a job working for a contractor. Feel the pain. You want to open a restaurant go, you know, and you want to open a McDonald's because they say they make a lot? Go flip burgers and do fries first. See what it's all about. You, know, you have to do the job before you know the job. Yeah. Yeah, but I feel like money, whenever money comes into a relationship, it just changes it. Of course. Especially with family. Yeah, but if you're desperate, you need to get the job done. You, your family doesn't want you to go under, so they want to help you, right? Yeah, but then they turn bitter. <laughs> well, eventually. you know. And if you fail, then you have to tell your family you failed. Yeah. You know? We all fail in life. Um, most, of, most of the things we do will end up failing, but it's those successes that keeps us moving forward. Right. So let's use an example, say... Your parent, you you go to your parents, and they uh, they say, "Well, how can we do it? You know, we want to help you." So what they do is get a line of credit on their house from the bank. Take a second mortgage. Take a second mortgage, and you start doing the project, and you're realizing, "Well, we don't know how to do this properly. We don't know how to do that properly." Or even worse, you go ahead and you do the renovation, and you really end up doing an unprofessional job. You go to sell the house and you're way under the expected profit margin. You're actually losing money. How are you going to pay back your parents? In tears. In tears. In tears. <laughs> exactly. Of I guess you don't have any kids. <laughs> no, no. It's how your parents are living with you and then you're both. Then you move tears. back with your parents, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it can get a lot worse, and, and basically we're talking about a second line, um, line of credit that can't get paid back, and basically that is on your parent's primary residence. So you could potentially lose your, your parent's primary residence on one bad flip. It's not worth taking your family's money. Unless your family is super rich. rich. Yeah, <laughs> super rich, and they don't care, and it's just fun, but it's... The average person, no, they're not super rich. Their family needs to retire. At the time you're trying to do this, they're in their retirement age. Leave them alone. Let them retire. Yeah, but on the other end, if you have a track record and you've done a few flips and you've shown a, a, a positive income from it, I think your parents would probably be more um, Open to the situation. Uh, open to the situation, and you should feel more. So they can pay that second line off faster. Where it might be, <laughs> yeah, it might be okay to go ahead and ask them at that point. So, what is better, private or um, hard money lenders? Cheaper interest rates. So, is there a big difference in interest rates between private and hard lenders? Or I don't know how much you're going to charge me. But exactly. So, if I was a <laughs> private investor and I believed in what you were doing, I could create my own rates. Correct. But a hard you could lender, create them, but we have to adjust we to them. We have to agree to them, yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. So right. let's say, so the average right now, as we said, you said was 12% right now for house flipping. For oh, hard money stuff or something. Hard buddy. Money. So a private lender may say, you know what? You've been very successful. Let's do 7%. Is that a low enough or is that high? Well, all I have to say is, is like, we started with one, let's say, hard money lender. And they started us at 15 because we never had a track record. Everybody wants a track record, right? So it's you pretty, have to accept that high. So you accept that high rate. And the bottom line is you're going to lose, let's say, $5,000 on this house. But you know what? You got to start somewhere. So you do that, and then you do another one. Then they say, then, you, then I tell them, because I'm a, I'm a 
old school businessman, as they say, and I tell him, hey, look, you know, I've done this twice with you. I paid your rate. I paid you on time. I got another guy who's going to do it for 10%. You're going to do it for better or not. So they, come, they always come back with something le- lower because everything is negotiable. With dealing with private people, I don't know if you've ever done that, but is a possibility that a private person is like, I've sent you money, but I kind of need that money back now. My situation's changed. Has that ever happened? So we have not borrowed any private money since we've started, and for the reasons um, I, that I gave you in the, in, on the last question. The best money is the free money. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you're kidding? Yeah, it the is best, the best money. Yeah, it is the best money. The, look, the, the best, your best scenario, as Alex was saying, okay, you get to the point, this is the way it works. Banks will probably give you the lowest interest rate, but banks will not lend you money to house flip. And that's, that's the reality. And the only place where you can get to the point where a bank is going to lend you the money is to show a, a track record. And for the first two years when we started, and I believe it's still the standard, the first two years they want to have a track record that you're making, you're making a profit and that you've actually been in business for the last two years before they'll even consider you for a loan. And we know that, you know, we're talking banks will say they're three and a half, four percent. That is going to be your lowest interest rate as far as borrowing any money. And it just takes, it's going to take at least two years of a track record before they'll even talk to you. Everybody wants to flip houses. They've seen the TV shows and everything else. Do they need to set up an LLC? Do they need to set up an entity? You want to start a company because if something goes sour, it's going to be the company, not your name. Because if it's your name, they're going to go after you, your house, and all your belongings. Obviously, you don't want to go sour, but things do happen. So you definitely want to start a business. And if you get really big, you want to have a lot of businesses for a lot of properties so they can go after that property, like, you know, address 101 is business A, address 102 is business B, et cetera, LLC or whatever you're going to call it, because otherwise they go after all, all of the properties instead of just that one property. But you're not looking to do that. You know, we, we're not here to try to lose money or make a wrong product, but I'm saying things do happen. So I recommend have m- multiple companies. So each house would have its own company in essence is what you're saying. So that way they don't go after all your houses. They just go after the one that may not have worked out. Or, I mean, it could be one to three. I'm talking when people are doing like 10, 15 houses. I'm saying if you're just doing like a few, it could be under one or, you know, one company's fine. But again, not under your name. So I guess what I'm saying is like, let's say I'm Anita here. She lives in New Jersey. She decides I'm going to buy a condo and flip this building. So instead of buying it under her name, she should just create an entity, yes. even though it's just one property? Correct. Correct. And then that way she's not held obligation in case anything fails. It's just the entity, not her herself. Correct. I mean, at the end of the day, they try to go after you, of course. You know, like I had a business and it was obviously under the business name. And then if something goes wrong, they go after the business name. Then they go after the who owns the building. Then they go after who owns that. And you know, I mean, if something's a real big problem, they're going to keep digging into the ditch. It's you know basically, basically creating an obstacle and just making it more difficult for that person to chase Juanita down. Okay. Because <laughs> we all know we don't want Juanita on the street. I'll just go back to Guyana, call it a day. They won't find me there. It's like 70% rainforest. I'm, I'm sure they'll have yeah, a hard time. You don't want them knocking on your door. You don't necessarily want them, you know, call it calling you directly constantly and emailing you and showing up at your doorstep. And of course, you know. So what kind of insurance do you need for house flipping? Do you like get specialized insurance for it? You want to get specialized insurance. There's a lot of different kinds of insurance that are involved with house flipping. Alex, for instance, um, his general contracting company needs insurance for his workers he needs insurance for his tools that are left on the job site. Which um, can get stolen. Which we've had happen before. 
Yeah, so you need different kinds of insurance and different things in place. So, yeah, general contracting, uh, your contractor, your subcontractors should all be insured. Insurance on the property itself in case something were to happen. Just imagine if you did a renovation and you're 75% complete and it's basically a new home at that point. It's close to being a new home, and there was a fire. Then, um, you who's going to pay? Yeah, you could p- potentially just lose everything. So, you get a different kinds of insurance. There's one that's called builder's risk insurance that is in the first portion of the um, phase, I should say, of the renovation, and then you get a um, construction insurance after that. That's a little more like a traditional home insurance. Liability is insurance expensive, or is it? Do you feel like why did I waste money on this insurance, or is it? Thank God I had this insurance. It's cost of doing business. It is um, just like gasoline prices expense. today. Yeah, it's an expense. And to answer your question, Brian, it's it's probably on average, I would say it's about double of what your average home insurance would be costing you. And how much do people spend on insurance? I don't even know what the insurance costs, but what would you say? Do you have to buy insurance for a year, two years, three years, or is it just month by month until you're done with the project? How do you, how long? So, yeah. So maybe with your home insurance, um, you're able to pay month by month, but most of the carriers, which is hard to find actually for, for flipping insurance is not actually easy to find. Cost about double your average home insurance and they would like to get paid in full one year ahead of time and then they reimburse you say if you're done in nine months and you're only you're only paying for those nine months and they'll reimburse they'll reimburse you the difference that's been my experience luckily i've i was able to find someone early on a very good company that's local right you buy like a a, you have to pay for the one year insurance let's just say it's one thousand two hundred dollars a hundred bucks a month just to make it easy for numbers because that's what they make you buy a one year plan. You can extend it if you need longer, but if you're finished with that house and it's sold in nine months, they're gonna refund you three hundred bucks. Like an escrow for when you sell your house where you personally live in, you know, the water bill, the escrow, they give you the money back. But you so. do need that capital where you're gonna pay the You have to upfront the money. Yeah. Um you might be able to get them to split it into two payments, something like that. Or you can pay quarterly. Uh, probably at best, but you're going to pay some interest on that. No. With everything going on currently with the economy and all the shortages that we're having, has this affected you in any way? We're doing a new house, which I know we're not talking about, but just to give you an example, you know, the lumber cost for the exact same house within six weeks went up $17,500. So, but the house went up too, so it might wash itself. But we we have to finish. We're in it. We have to finish. That's what people need to understand is like when you start, you must finish because you're going to ruin your credibility, your, you know, everything about if you ever want to try to get a loan again or anything like that. You have to you have to be in it all the way. Even if you're going to lose money, don't stop because you think, oh, I'm going to lose 20,000. Well, you're going to lose a lot more than that if you don't finish. You know, I get, Alex, you're talking about recently. Like, yeah. Like in the past week or two. Six weeks. In, six well, weeks. five weeks, something like that, yeah. Okay. Because, you know, the big drastic change happened basically tail end of the COVID epidemic that prices from the suppliers in a lot of different areas ended up costing how much How much increase? 15, 20% say, maybe. At least. So on $100,000, which we're not doing a $100,000 job, it went up literally from like, let's say a $200,000 job to like 240000 You know, do you have extra 40000 That's the big question. That's, so, you know. That's probably what you're looking at, say, as your profit. We'll just use that as an example. And right. But the thing is. There's, there's your potential profit on that, on that home. Maybe we'll say it was 40000 your projected profit, and um, and there it is. It's already it's already, but the prices have went up. It's already gone. So yeah, that profit's already gone. Is my point. But well, um, no, necessarily that profit's already gone. The forty thousand, but you thought you were going to sell again. Just to make numbers easy for three hundred, but it's now going for three fifty. 
So that forty thousand, you you kind of went, you kind of made ten thousand on your forty, which is then twenty percent of your money. So you're actually like you're still winning. That's the idea, right? Well, that brings up the next question. Here is okay. Costs have gone up. Everyone, you buy the house, you're getting ready to flip it. How much extra cash should you have on the side for the unexpected for those type things? Materials going up, labor going up. 15, 20%. Of the house value or? Uh, of, your, of your, no, of the um, construction cost. Of the construction cost. Right. So if the construction cost you figure out is about 100000 you need to have at least. 115. 115. At least. 120. More comfortable, yeah. Yeah. And how often do you have to go into those special reserves? Uh, in the last year, every time. But again, the houses are selling more for than what we anticipated. So that 20000 that you're spending, you're going to get your 20000 back, and then you're probably going to make, let's say, 15%, 20% on that 20000 So you're, you're in the good, but you got to have that 20000 Well, that's depending on the housing going up in value. Interest rates are going up, as we all know from all different types of investments, whether you're bonds or whatnot. It's a seesaw effect. As interest rates go up, the values go down, and it'll always happen that way. Currently, I know we're in D.C. area, so D.C. seems to be immune to that for the high-income earners. Now we're raising interest rates. Do you expect the prices to go down, and should that be factored into while you're flipping the house, how much lower the value of the house is going to go down during the process? The thing with the houses is... The prices are going up. The interest rates are going up. Yes, now the prices have stopped going up. But if you look at the interest rate that we're paying now, historically, it's still a good rate. So what happened was the interest rates were so cheap, people who had any sense would go do something because, I mean, who's going to give you money for 3%? I don't think my dad would give me money for 3%. So I know I take advantage. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't either. That's the problem with you. And I've known you too long. You're still not giving me money for 3%. But, you know, that's, that's what you have to be up against. So should you work with real estate agents or have your own real estate license? So that's, you know, a good question. You should definitely get your license if you can. And Is it easy to get the license? I have not taken the test. Um, I've I did in college. <laughs> Yeah. But I didn't renew it in time. Oh, no. It is, um, I'd say it's within grasp for, for anyone who applies himself. So with, with um, you know, real estate, you're talking an average 5 6% that you're going to pay your realtor. You're going to pay on the purchasing side of the property. You're going to pay on the tail end of the prop side when you go to sell the property. So we're talking, you know, 5% of, we'll say, a $500,000 home. Yeah, $25,000. That, that might be your profit. I mean, of course, your profit, you were saying, is going to be twenty five, including the interest rate, I mean, including the commission for the person, which could have been fifty. So if you want to be your own agent, then that's good, too. So you put that money right back in your pocket, and that just means you're going to make a significantly amount more, more, more money. So... How many hats can you wear, though? You know, like how many projects are you doing? One project at a time, and you're happy with that, and you're making, you know, the commission on both sides, and, you know, that's all you want. You know, everybody wants something different. You know, for me, I can't do that because I'm doing multiple projects, and I'm already, you know, as they say, deep in water with work. I, now I have to start trying to sell the house to you. So it just it's too much to do. So it depends. You have to you know you have to draw a line on how much can you actually handle. Just like any job, you know, which Alex has mentioned, you know, you need to you need to be experienced in that department. So it can be on the on the purchasing side. Did I pay the right amount for this uh, for this home, or am I pricing this this home that's that's been renovated for sale? Am I pricing it appropriately? So you know that's where experience comes in. And um, you can make a lot of mistakes. Um, so having a an experienced realtor on your side that might be willing to work in the four and a half five percent range could just be uh, an expense that's worth it. Cost of doing business. Um, if you ever like walked into a house and you've like started 
nitpicking as things like oh i see they cut corners in this area or like they use the cheapest material <laughs> or they all could've... the time <laughs> well that's the house that we're looking for because we're looking to flip it right so we're looking for the house that cut the corners so we can fix the corners but what if like you went into like a friend's house and oh yeah oh. friends don't like me coming over yeah. <laughs> we can't help but start talking about stuff and uh, yeah, yeah you got to be careful so i hear this term all the time and i'm sure a lot of people do arv after repair value, what is that? How does that affect anything? And what does it mean to the general public? So ARV is uh, after you, um, like you said, after repair value. So it's basically what you're going to be selling that home or what price you're going to put that home at after you've done all the repairs. So what it's going to be listed for on the, uh, on the MLS, on the... Uh, real estate or realtors website. It's as simple as that. It's that simple. How much is it going to sell? How much is it going to be listed for is what I should say, not what it's going to sell for. But how do you know how much it's going to be listed for? When you buy a home in your head, how do you calculate what the ARV is going to be? Right. So that ARV <clears throat> or the after resale value is going to change from the time you purchase that property. Okay. You got to think, it's going to be eight, nine months, possibly even 10 months down the road by the time you've completed the project. So that all those numbers that you first calculated when you started the project, and we'll just say I, I was projecting to make $35,000 profit on this, on this, but after that, you know, eight, nine, 10 months have gone by, the property values have changed. They've either gone down, okay, so I'm going to end up losing money, or they've gone up. I'm going to make more money than I thought I was. So do comparables in the area affect um, how you flip the house? I mean, I would say, of course, because that's what everyone looks at. You know, they go, you're going to go, even, you know, we're buying a property that we want to flip. We want to see how much someone else paid for the same kind of house in the same kind of shape. So that has a lot to do with it, and then depending on if you're doing one property or, or two or three properties, then there's a value on if I'm doing the three jobs because I'm the contract, it wouldn't be better to have all three properties within three blocks compared to having one an hour away, another one two hours away, another one half hour away. You know, that's not good either. So that has a value to me at least, not to Terry. No, but he's a good friend of mine. So he was, he actually looks after me. So I give him credit for that. That's why we're still in business because he actually doesn't want me driving to three hours. He doesn't, he want, you know, he looks at every job like he's doing it. So that's, that's what keeps our friendship together. Yeah. So in the past, we, um, in Northwest, when we were doing a couple of the homes that we've discussed already, we actually had three homes that were then two blocks of each other. So what, what, what that was doing and what Alex is saying, it's cutting down on his time and effort to, to get the job. Yeah. It helps get, get the job a lot faster. Um, his workers can be in a centralized location, so we're cutting down on the travel time, cutting down on the time it takes to get the materials. You know, Alex is working constantly on a daily basis. You know, you're you're working on a house, and then the worker says, "Ah, oh, I need this, I need that," and he's running to Home Depot or or Lowe's to get the materials, or the other house, or the other house. Grab it from the other house if you can afford to. In this case. And that's going to cut, cut your time down. He could replenish those materials later. So here, here's a good thing. Everyone, I guess, listening wants to make money, right? So everyone knows what a porta potty is, right? So you have to get a porta potty, and it's 125 bucks. You get three porta potties for each job. It's 125 times three, which is 375. Well, if you have two jobs next to each other, you share the porta potty. Well, in one year of 125, I mean, 10 months of 125 is what? 1,250 extra for you. So, I mean, but then you lost 1,250 on something else, so you're even. So that's kind of how I do it, you know? That's the part to tear I don't tell about, but now he heard. So, oh, well, that's okay. But then I don't tell him I lost on something. So, I mean, you know, I mean, it, of course, if it's a big number, I have to tell him. But, you know, Cut, make, the, the point is cutting all those corners, all those little corners adds up. And I'm sure a lot of people don't think about the porta potties. Um, we had our bathroom renovated, and yes, the porta potty had to be there because we have 
one one bathroom. And when it's not in service, you have to go somewhere. Your neighbor. Or the neighbor, or my kids use the tree. So I'm known for using the Or the, the sink, the kitchen sink. <laughs> so. Well, speaking of materials, how often do stuff get to- stolen, though? So here's a good story. So I'm a firm believer of not hiring the guy at Home Depot that's looking for the day job. Because you don't know who they are, um, what they're about, and what they want. I understand they need money, or if they're legal or not. Nothing against Home Depot. Yeah, of course, nothing against Home Depot or Lowe's. We love Home Depot. Oh, yeah, I mean, I live off Home Depot. I mean, I have a, a, a certain rep that I deal with, and that's kind of how I place my orders. But um, now I got sidetracked. What, what was the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, okay, so you're flipping a house, and things get stolen. Oh, yes. I'm sorry about the stolen. So um, I actually needed some labor uh, to do some digging in a basement. And um, one of the guys that works for me knew that the other guy couldn't come. He goes, can I bring somebody that I know? And I was like, that's fine. If Only if you know him. So he brought him and they did the job, let's say. So that was fine. And then um, we have tools in the house. And some of the tools are big tools. They don't fit in those box chest things that you, you, know, you put down in the property. That you can lock up. That you can lock up like a jackhammer or something like that or some kind of wet saws that are like too big. So um, I go back the next day and somebody broke in and stole like, you know, $13,000 of my tools and they're actually my tools. So I didn't tell Terry anything and I didn't call my insurance because I'm a wise businessman because I know my insurance policy is expiring in three months. And if I call, they're not going to renew me. So, or they're going to renew me with a much higher rate, right? So I just ate that part at my own cost because that's the cost of doing business. And I ended up getting a different insurance provider because I was just shopping for insurance insurances at the time. And I ended up, it was like a four year plan, but I'm going to, after the four years, it's I'll, I'll break even. But when I went to go and ask for the insurance, the first question is any robberies? That have been reported. So the answer was no, because they have not been reported. <laughs> so, I mean... So most a, of the time you eat it. Yeah, you have to eat it. You know, I mean, things disappear all the time. So it's just, a, you know, again, it's a cost of doing business. If you think it's going to cost you $10, it's probably going to cost you 12 I mean, that's just the way it is, you know? Okay, going into the last question here. In your opinion and your experience... As a first-time flipper, should I be looking at rural areas, the city, or college towns? If I'm going to do this tomorrow, which area should I look at first? My answer is where you get the best, where you can find the best deal. I don't care what area it is; it's where you can find the deal. That's that's always my answer with Terry. I don't care if it's in this street or in that area. Where's the best deal? Because today we have the money. Today we're going to buy. And that's the answer, because if you're looking for the certain area and that's not the best deal, at the end of the day, when you sell that prop, you're looking for the profit. So if you found a really good deal somewhere that's like 50000 under market value, then our job another 30 minutes a day, man. You know, So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the only way I can answer that question. I can't answer it like, you know, where do I go? Yes, of course, some like, you know, like if you go to College Park here and where Maryland University is, you can find some of those homes where I mean, it's always going to be rentable. And you want to buy it as an investor and you're going to rent it all the time. You know, you want to deal with that kind of a part of a business. And well, then maybe that's the best thing for you. So everyone has a, everyone's looking for something different. I'm looking at the end of the day because I'm not keeping the house. I want to sell it. Okay. And Terry? Yeah. So um, just like Alex said, so it really depends what your plan is. If you're using, we'll say, campus campus properties um, as an example, then, um, you know, what is your intention? Are you planning on doing this renovation to hold on to the property there's which is called buy and hold and uh it's a terminology that's used a lot in the uh, in the flipping industry you can buy and hold it and you're guaranteed to probably make a significant profit by holding on to it on a college campus if it's within you know a few blocks of a college campus in Alex's um, and you know our 
our business is basically renovating a home and then selling it for the most. So I would say be in the city, but being in the city also comes with a cost. It's all a matter of what Alex has said numerous times. It's, uh, you know, you're making your money when you purchase it, right? So the process, the, the, the property value right now is skyrocketing skyrocketed everywhere you go more so in the city so if you can get something at a reasonable price and then renovate it and then resell it and get out of it then that's what you do rural properties you know you might get a lot more real estate you know and in, in, instead of a quarter acre you're purchasing one acre or three acres stuff like that and that's you know that's kind of a, a outside the topic today but it's uh you know that's doable if the property like was sub subdividable for instance and you could build multiple homes on there then um i would recommend doing that but that's that's something else so to answer your question i think being in the city is um and just buying something that is uh you know a little below market value is probably your best scenario right right now have you ever like encounter uh, new home flippers with a, like a god ego complex? And you look like I have no idea what I'm talking about. But like, have you ever like encountered those home flippers where they're like they know everything? Yeah, have yeah, of you? Of course, so, yeah. Do you yeah, ever I, like I, knock them down like a pedal or no, two? No, I don't knock them down. I mean, they're gonna knock themselves down. I believe in, as my mom always said, you know, time comes, you know where you stand. For the last bit of advice, uh, Terry, you get two things to tell a first-time home flipper they need to know. What is the most two important things to you? And then, Alex, you'll go right after Terry. The two most important things for you. Don't buy right. Buy right. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I had to say mine because I've been saying that the whole time. I have to jump in front of Terry because I don't want him stealing mine. All right. Let's That's been my whole out. conversation is buy right. Buy right. Okay. So, Alex, we're going to start with Alex. So, buy right. Buy right. And what else? Buy right. Buy right. And... Know your subcontractors. Okay. And Terry? I, I, I don't know if I have anything uh, else to put on top of that, really. I think that is the best advice. Um, you know, make sure you do find a good, a good contractor that you're comfortable with, hopefully someone who's you've worked with before. That would be my advice. And someone, you know, obviously it's going to be someone, someone that you trust and someone you've compared pricing with and is going to give you... Um, the best price and um that's that's good advice and yeah thank you for taking my advice yeah by right <laughs> by right by right don't ruin the relationship i'm assuming like they say location 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 by right by right by right please let the people know your, the name of your company again and where you're from and this will be it okay i'm terry palmer from a t property investments llc and i'm alex momchilovich from a t properties and alexander general contracting incorporated and i'm brian hart I'm Juanita Jaikran. And thank you guys for listening. Hey, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe and like, leave a review. And we'll see you next time at Investor Coffee Shop.